my saints of the faith. I don't know if you realize, but we together are the saints. Um, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says, um, dear, dear saints. And sometimes we think of saints as only those people who are particularly set apart and, and earmarked as the saints. But all of us, us who are believers, constitute the, the saints of faith. Um, and according to the liturgical calendar, today is All Saints Sunday. And so we celebrate the saints, not just those of us here, but the saints of every place and every time, those who have gone before, and those who are still. So it is a wonderful day as we gather. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of here visiting. I want to welcome you. We're glad you're here and hope you will be blessed as we worship together. Um, this morning is a, we have a, <coughs> excuse me, I had a special announcement, and that is that we celebrate the birth of Thomas Woodward Robertson, who is his great-grandson, is that right? Grandson. Yeah, grandson. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, Lindsay. It's your great-grandson. You're my great-grandson. <laughs> Keep us one with all who proclaim your gospel 
until such time as we finish our race, collapsing into your arms where you wait for us at the finish of your new creation begun in Christ, the pace setter and perfecter of the way, the truth and life everlasting. Amen. Please stand if you are able to join in the gathering hymn. Holy, 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 it's number 138. 138.
So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both the, of the living and the dead. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit. When we become stubborn and unbelieving, open our hearts to receive your word. Then set us free to follow in the power of Christ's love. Amen. The first scripture reading is Hebrews 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great <coughs> cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and has taken his seal at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls of lost heart. Our second scripture reading this morning um, comes from Ephesians <coughs> chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of you was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then the verse 11. He himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full statute of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But, speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth, and building itself up in love. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. As I said earlier, today is All Saints Sunday. Um, for All Saints, we give thanks to God. For all the saints who are together in every time and place in this church, in the church visible, in the church invisible. 
We give thanks to God for Christ's work that reconciles us to God and brings this body together as one. On All Saints Day, we often pause and remember, particularly those who have gone before, um, the ancients, but also those more in the present time. We remember those who have been particularly important to us in their personal lives and their faith development. Um, many of those who have been witnesses of the faith to us. In Hebrews 11, which Barbara read for us, uh, in Hebrews, well, she read Hebrews 12, but in Hebrews 11, which precedes that one little paragraph today, the writer to the Hebrews wrote about faith, and he said, Faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we cannot see or do not see. And he then goes on to chronicle uh, the faithful ancestors in the church, many who had persevered, trusted God, uh, stepped out in faith, and journeyed with God. And then, having been reminded of all of these faithful, mostly in the Old Testament, uh, in chapter 12, as Barbara read today, it says that because we are surrounded by these people who have lived in faith, shown us what it is to be faithful and how God is faithful still, we are to press on and run with perseverance the race that is before us. So that's a little bit about all saints. I want you to hold that thought and I have a question for you. Did you enjoy the World Series this year? I'll be honest with you. I, I know it ended this week, it finished this week, because I'm going to watch some of it. And I happened to see the former president on the screen, so I thought it was probably the Texas Rangers that were one of the teams. But other than that, I really didn't know anything about the World Series. I'm not so into um, sport or watching sports. I'm not really a, a spectator. But I did hear that the Rangers played and the Rangers won. But I don't watch a lot of sports because I hate to watch a team lose. And when there are two teams, one of them loses. And even when it's not my team, I don't like to watch them to lose. But baseball is particularly not high on my list as a sport to watch. I find it a little bit slow. But I remember watching the World Series back in 1977. That would be the year that Glenn and I got married. And we were at his parents' house down on the farm. And the World Series on TV was the only game in town. <laughs> and so I remember watching that that year. And then I don't remember watching it again until a few years ago, just before COVID. And the Washington Nationals were in the World Series. And my neighbors were big fans. And Glenn and I had lived in Northern Virginia for 11 years. And we'd even been to a concert at National Stadium. So it felt really like the home team to me. So I watched a few of the games, a few innings of a few of the games. But I missed the big events of the games. Somehow it seems that no one told me, but the action happens in the seventh inning. And I tended to give up and go to bed in the sixth inning. <laughs> and uh, there, there were seven games that year, and in, um, in four that the Nats won, three of those, they came ahead in the seventh inning. But when I left, they were not winning in the sixth inning. And in that last game, which would be win or lose, winner takes all in that game, in that last game, um, they had lost three of the last four games, and they were down by two at the bottom of the sixth. And it really wasn't looking so promising that they were going to come ahead. It really didn't look like they had what it took to win this game. So I went to bed 
He glad it me up when he came to bed to tell me that the, the Nats had won the game. Not that I cared that much, but <laughs> just to give me the information that they had won. And I, I thought, uh, well, for their faithful um, fans who persevered when it seemed like they wouldn't make it, they had the joy of watching them win. And it was something that they would never forget, or at least not for a long time. But I thought about how many times do we walk out before the game's over? How many times do we give up and, and throw in the towel, call it a day, check out before the game is done? In the game of life, in the life of faith, there are many times, many enemies, that look like the result might not be what we hope. Or that the result might not be so good. Places where it's easy to lose sight of the goal. But as people of faith, we have to stay in the game. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus the perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross and has now taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. If you think about Jesus' life, can you see the places where he pressed on? When no one stood with him? When it seemed like defeat? But he pressed on because he believed and knew the glory that was at the end. As people of faith, we press on. Today, as we pause to remember and celebrate witnesses to our faith, witnesses to God's great power, his work in the world, his grace and love, we think of people who have seen and known the wonder of God. And attest it to that, even in the face of great challenge. People who pressed on in faith. The ancient pillars persevered through times of defeat, keeping their eyes on God and continuing in His work. These are those who have done God's work in the world and brought us to the place where we are today, where we know faith. And we gather here in this lovely sanctuary to worship our God. If you've not read about Abraham, Moses, Joshua, or Gideon, Deborah, or David, John, Peter, or Paul, if these are not familiar, if you can't sit and remember their story, then I encourage you to pick up the Bible and read that story again. And see how they pressed on when the future might not have looked so promising. But maybe that seems hard. An easier thing to do would be to pick up your phone or your laptop or your iPad and Google those names. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Deborah, David, John, Peter, Paul. Just Google the name of the word scripture. And it'll come right down your phone or your, your computer, your tablet. And you'll be able to read how God was faithful to them as they sought to walk in faith. Hebrews 12 points out to us that these stories of faith, these stories about this cloud of witnesses, remind us of God's steadfast life. A reminder we need as we try to live that life of faith. And it encourages us to know and to love and to walk with God. Best estimates are though that uh, the earliest texts of this, this book were written about 1400 BC, and the latest inclusions were probably in about the year 100. A.D. or C.E., the century in which Jesus lived. 
And we all know that much has happened, and while Jesus is the rock and the foundation of the church, we all know that much has changed and happened in the church since the year 100. Many faithful witnesses have stood strong. Those who helped establish the church in the world, those who spread the news of Jesus to the far corners of the earth, those who sacrificed to share the love of Christ with others, people like Luther and Calvin and Knox, people like the Booth, the Booth founded the Salvation Army that has helped so many. But if you move into the 20th century, some of those among the cloud of witnesses that we would remember might would be, for some of us, maybe Corey Tenboom, who survived the German concentration camps and wrote a lot about that, or C.S. Lewis, whose books speak of faith, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian and witness who uh, was martyred uh, during the German um, German cause, against the German cause. Brother Andrew, I don't know if you know of him, but he was also known as God's smuggler and um, smuggled Bibles into Russia. And then there was a man named Bruce Wilkerson. I remember reading his one of his books in high school. And then many years later, the first one was The Sword and the Switchblade. And then many years later, he came out with another book, Jabez Acres. Uh, and both of these really spoke to the heart of living for God. And then in my life, there were two musicians, Keith Green and Rich Mullins, both who died young, but wrote fabulous music for the Christian. And one I think many of you would remember would be um, Jimmy Carter, who, while he was president, maybe wasn't so popular, but it's truly for some, but has truly become known for his faith as he's lived out of cheers. And then there was Billy Graham who shared his faith all over the world. There were many more in the 20th century. The 20th century was a time of great faith. In my life, there were people I knew, people that were close to me, that I would call witnesses of the faith. My grandmother, my fifth grade school teacher, I always wanted her to adopt me. <laughs> but I'm also indebted to that early Sunday school teacher, whose name I can't remember, who taught me to sing this little light of mine. I remember it so vividly. It was a room with white walls and a great door. She stood in front of us. We were dressed to the nines for Sunday school. And the door was behind her, and we just sang with such enthusiasm and probably no tune. This little light of mine, just celebrating the love of Jesus in this little light. I was about three years old, probably my earliest, earliest child in the universe. And I'm indebted to the Bible school teacher who taught us about the disciples, <clears throat> and to Miss Smith, who taught my son in school class for two years. And then there were the Seymours, who taught senior high and took us out and bought us pizza every Sunday night if we'd come to church. A little bribe. None of them were perfect, <coughs> maybe not even great at teaching or singing, but they instilled in me the faith. They gave up themselves, trusting in the grace and mercy of God, not knowing whether their work would make a difference and with absolutely no idea of the impact that that foundation would have in my life. They witnessed to the faith, they persevered, and they made a difference. It was their moment in time. Where would I be without those saints and the work that they did? the care and the words and the teaching and the witness. Where would we be without the efforts and the witness and the love of the saints that have gone with you? Who has made a difference 
in your life? Who has impacted you? You might think of some great Christians that you've heard about or know about. People that wrote books or sang songs or teachers or a relative. Right here in this church, we can identify many saints who devoted themselves to God's service. People who gave tirelessly and sacrificially, people who did and people who do, to God's work, using their gifts and resources to build this church, both physically and spiritually. As I think of you, as I think of us gathered in this place, how did it happen that we are here worshiping here today? I think of the faithful who walked with God and stepped out in faith to establish a church in this place, to bring something where there was nothing. We talk about, and it's true, that it is hard to grow a church today, but it was also hard to start a church 25 years ago as well. It took time, money, and talent. It took a pastor who responded to the call of God and took a risk to move with his spouse to a small town to devote their lives to God's work in this place. It took many faithful witnesses to God to bring friends to teach, and to build. People would remember as we celebrate that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. I don't attempt to name them all, but I would name a few that might ring a bell with you. The Goodalls, the Calhouns, Bill Burton, David Jenny Carey, Barbara Prodigan, and by the way, all of these are not passed on to the church invisible. Some are still with us. The Millers, Edna Earl, who brought laughter and fun, a critical element for the community of faith. Cliff Voss, who was here when the church was chartered and is here now. And he can tell you of the many faithful witnesses that persevered. Jackie Oren and Susan May were a force in making the amazing journey to Bethlehem. Did I say that right? Journey to Bethlehem happen. And in my two years here, I've had the pleasure and the joy of visiting with so many of you. And I've heard so many stories. But as I visited it with George Curry when he was preparing his move after many years here, I'm sitting in his front room and we're just chatting and he's remembering the joy he had in coming here to this church and planting the bushes outside as y'all were landscaping a new church. But it helped make it happen. And of course I visited with Jim Harris and he talked so much about the joy he had in helping design the extension of the sanctuary. And the joy he had, so he was here till the week he died, singing in the choir and enjoying the fellowship of the community, but always also a witness to the faith. And Jane and Charlie Biggs are gone now, and she's in the church invisible, but he's moved. Charlie always talked about the joy that he had in making crosses that I think he gave to new members for conference. Compliments and building special pieces of furniture. Just giving himself, that's what he knew to do, and so he did it for the faith. And John Dickey, who made us all feel welcome into the body of Christ. I don't believe I ever met another person that made me feel so welcome. There were and there are many hands, many treasures that have made and made God's work happen here. Not for what was seen 
not for what already was, but in faith for what was believed to be happening, what was unseen, but hope everyone was hopeful that God would act on their efforts. Some of these people by the Spirit of God were what I call game changers. Little did they know the impact they would have on you or on this body or on a program that we were creating. And so as we pause today, I am grateful for their willingness to offer themselves to God, to be a witness to us, to make a difference for all of those who have gone before. We remember and we thank God. But now, it's our turn. It's up to us to be the ones that press on. I'm keenly aware, I believe we are all keenly aware of the desperate need in our world today for game changers. People who are witnesses to the faith, who walk with God, who are willing to seize this moment and not to wait, to make a difference, to press on and to give themselves to God for the faith. Trust in not what they can see, but living to be a witness to the faith. To witness to the lost, to the hungry, to the hurting. The needs come in all sizes and shapes. But friends, it is our time. Our world. Our church. This community needs people who will step up in this moment in time and be a witness. People who will give themselves to God and to His work in this world. They did it before for us. Where might you have an impact and be a witness to God's grace and mercy? How might you make a difference in God's world? When the Nats were playing the, the World Series, as I said earlier, it was a winner and lose, winner takes all. Lose a game, lose a series. And it was the seventh inning. The opportunities were growing slim. It could go either way. Teams have done it before, but I'm not sure I was on board to think it could be done again, to come back in the seventh inning. A batter comes to the plate. The ball comes at him. And the batter swings for all he's worth. Gives it all he's got. It's a game changer. The bat meets the ball, the batter meets the need of the team. The run scores, and the Nets now lead and proceed to win the game and the series. The world needs a game changer. It's our turn. Others have gone before. But now, it's a new day on the horizon. It's the air trying to step up to the plate to let the bat meet the ball and bring the witness to the world. So I ask, can I get a witness to the wonder of the grace of God? Amen.
Gracious God, as we gather, we thank you for each of these, for your memories, and for the hope and confidence that we have that we are all one together in the body of Christ, visible and invisible. gather at this table, this is the Lord's table. It is not a Presbyterian table, but for all of us, all of those who trust in Jesus as your Savior, for those who are baptized into the faith. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us pray. We lift our hearts in praise to you, God of Abraham and Sarah, Miriam and Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Ruth, David, priests and prophets, Mary, Joseph, Peter, Paul, the apostles, the martyrs, and ordinary unknown saints. God of our mothers and fathers and our children to all generations. You made us and love us with a steadfast love. When we deny our godly heritage, you call us home to you through the saints dedicated to your will. With all the people of faith, 
place, of every time and place, we give all glory to you. Our hearts are filled with thanksgiving for the gift of Jesus, your Son, our Lord, who lived in accord with your will, laying down his life for the sin of the world, the hope of our salvation. As we gather at this table and receive the, these gifts of cup and bread, by your Spirit, make us one in communion with you and one another. And as we eat this bread and drink this cup, may we see your glory and be strengthened to follow you until Christ comes and we feast together with all the saints at your great reunion. Keep your church one in service to the world, even as we pray for the world that you love. Speak your peace in this world where wars rage and violence triumphs. We pray for the health of all nations, that all people might flourish for the upcoming elections in our country, for people in positions of power. We pray for those who grieve, for those who are sick. Especially we ask your hand of healing upon Twy, upon little Thomas. And we thank you for the many answered prayers for John. We pray for those struggling to live in the power of your resurrection. Meet them in their places of need. Meet us in our places of need. Send forth comfort as only you can give. And shape us into a beautiful people. The holy people of God. And we give all glory to you, Father, Son, and to Holy Spirit. And as a children of God, we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was with his disciples, and after blessing them, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Keep this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is a new, co a new covenant sealed in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I would invite the elders to come forward to serve. As you eat, we will hold it and all eat together.
that the body of Christ is good for you. Take it. which no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. <coughs> As we remember, we think about being a witness to the faith. And so we offer ourselves to God. We watch for those opportunities where the door might open or the spirit might nudge. And we remember that God has been sufficient in the past and will be again. And so we offer ourselves to God with confidence that he might take who we are and what we have and use it for his glory 